Hey, today I'm interviewing Jason Cross of the Peculiar Form and FabLab ATX, and we're going to talk about all the really cool stuff he's doing with the laser cutter. So, Jason, thanks for joining us. Uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for having me. My pleasure. So, so uh, tell us real quick, what is the what is the Peculiar Form and FabLab ATX? Uh, the Peculiar Form is sort of a, a amorphous business I put together to focus my sort of architectural research, my um, programming research, the overlap of basically all of my interests and sort of that being a peculiar form and that I'm a peculiar form and that the relationships between other artists, designers, technologies, all of these things take on peculiar forms and that um, what traditionally was these disparate sort of um, areas of uh, um, work, be it uh, mechanical engineering, this or that, um, the idea in the peculiar form is that it's all sort of in some sort of amorphous relationship, be it biology, mechanics, uh, fabrication, these types of things, and that's what we try to focus on is the opportunity between all of these things. Um, nice. Fab Lab ATX is sort of um, bloomed out of the idea of like Neil Gershenfeld at MIT and the whole Fab Lab model. Um, it started as being the idea of a more public collaborative space, but as we've developed it, there's another place in town called Make ATX, and they actually have more of a collaborative space. We started out of our garage. And we found that we really didn't have the facilities to um, deliver that type of um, service, so we've become more targeted towards um, sort of uh, what I'd call maybe micro-entrepreneurs. People okay. are doing more than just craft but they don't have the um, means or facilities to have a laser cutter, but they actually have some technological need as well. So as opposed to just being like a Kinko's where they just want to come get something made, they might have questions about materials, thicknesses. Um, uh, I've had people that are developing thin sheet batteries come to me, people from the advanced research laboratories at UT for doing diaphragms for microphones. and. Those to me are really, really exciting versus sort of what uh, originally had a few people wanting to do like quadcopter acrylic cutting where they basically wanted to treat a, a cheaper quadcopter. There was a few people that said uh, they'd send me links to like an Instructables page and say, can you cut this for me? And it'd be the email. And so um, it got to where the craft side, I think there was a lack of um, sort of focus and rigor to where it wasn't in our best interest to try to support that. But it, I think it is good that there's a community of people just wanting to get their fingers wet in that. So I'm glad that there is a Make, make ATX, that there's, I think they pay $100 a month and you sort of can go there as you want to. Uh, so where, they, have the, they have the tech shop model kind of yeah, thing, whereas... Which we sort of thought about, but as we progressed, we just realized that it really wasn't efficient for what we wanted to do. So you, right now you deal primarily with, with laser cutters. Are, you know, are there plans to expand to other tools to offer other services? Completely. We'd love to get into 3D printing um, is a big one, and um, uh, that's probably the next affordable uh, one. 3D printing uh, has come down so much in the past, uh, really, two to five years. It's pretty amazing. Um, also, a three-axis mill. I ran the mill when I was at uh, graduate school at Rice you know, Architecture. Um, I ran the mill for two years there, so three-axis to five-axis mills. And, uh, you know, um, if budget were no issue, we'd like to go to a higher wattage laser cutter as well so we could do thin sheet metals as well. Um, but, yeah, so all of those things we're really interested in. We try to stay on top of what technologies are being developed um, because uh, price point is always huge. A company like um, Stratesis, uh, I can't remember the name, uh, pronunciation, but, like, them coming out with a $10,000 3D printer, whereas just uh, when I was at Rice, the 3D printers were all Z-Core, $50,000, and they're printing starch, you know, whereas now they're printing ABS and they're $10,000. So, um, yeah, that, those are the different things. But, um, yeah, finance would be the number one uh, uh, block is getting to any one of those. So, so with this laser cutter, what, what are some of the projects, like the most common projects that you're noticing people are coming to you for on, the, like, the micro-enterprise side? Um, well, uh, um, one thing that we uh, sort of, I've seen a lot of is um, a lot of um, patterning, I guess would be the best way to put it, um, from doing um, uh, medical bracelets that are other than just a traditional medical bracelet or um, watch bracelets or um, in the case of uh, uh, microphone diaphragms where there's just tons of tiny little holes, but lots of repetition and patterns. 
okay. seems to be something that the laser cutter is um, incredibly well suited for and um, gets into uh, a lot of more, like, like the gentlemen, uh, the two guys who were doing thin sheet batteries, just a lot of like thin materials where it's really precise cuts. The um, advanced research laboratories, I think there was a tolerance of 0.03 inches. You know, so when you're getting into microns and stuff like that, there's a level of detail that people are looking for that I don't think other tools really are capable of. So. That, yeah, that's true. That's so. Is it is it more prototyping that they're coming to you for, or is it more production? Yeah, yeah. Uh, ARL, they were developing like 12 microphones, sensors. They're sort of like sonar microphone type things, um, and uh, they were doing one off. And then the idea is, after they do one, they might come to us for doing. Uh, different versions of these diaphragms that are within their my microphone to uh, um, advance it. But it's definitely small run for uh, very specific use. And so it's not really a, a commercial enterprise. Even the other um, studios like, uh, um, I think it's Push Start, I may have uh, told you about, and uh, Push Start Creative, they've done a lot of um, sort of testing different patterns, materials, and stuff for their clients. They did a board game that was a custom board game. so had foldable pieces, their own cards. So that was a graphic design group that took basically what was, a, I think was a marketing tool exercise for an internal, for I believe it was like Dell or something like that. So it was like their management group to play cards with each other, to learn more about each other. But they ended up laser cutting everything and making it a real personalized experience as if it was made by Mattel. Um, but so for them, it was a real, um, uh, sort of self-identified, branded, uh, internal experience, which I hadn't considered beforehand, uh, really. But uh, those types of quick one-offs to make it fully customized is really big in the, the micro level. Very cool. So how are you, are you, I mean, are you actively promoting uh, this space and your capabilities or, you know, is it word of mouth? How are people finding you? It's word of mouth. Since I didn't have a formal space, it's just the garage, I've strayed away from trying to advance too much of us as a space because I didn't want to get caught in the scenario of offering things that we don't actually have. Yeah. So um, I'll turn people on if they're looking for more of a collaborative space to make ATX. I'm happy to share um, uh, uh, links, references to other people that are trying to do the same thing because I know we can't facilitate everything for everyone. And I know that everyone's creative urges is, is, you know, pretty much a positive thing, wanting to make stuff. It's just we, like, with our own time constraints and budgets, we, we've found that we just can't facilitate that for everyone. We've even found doing more research to try to help those people that come to us with those needs that there's um, Austin Hacker Lab, and it's even $65 a month. Um, but with all of those things, we've also found some people are willing to pay $300 to us for a quick project because they don't want to be having to pay $100 or $65 a month. They don't want to be part of the community. They just want to get their job done at that point in time. And it's sort of like, you know, you can go rent the stuff to carpet clean your own house or you can pay $200 to have the guys do it that have done it before and those types of things. So we have some of that too to where I'll let people know that there's this other option and they don't want to, you know, <laughs> stuff. It's, they, they want the service. They, you know, they want you to cut it for them, you to do it, and then they have what they need. Yeah, because, well, my attitude is if it's going to be the $100 a month, then it's just like Kinko's. You show up, you tell me, you give me the file, you tell me what to do, and that's it. I'm ignorant of everything. But, and so that's what sort of happened is more and more people needed more knowledge. And I was like, well, you have to pay for that. So it became something to where uh, it just sort of um, filled in its own gap to where we became more of a service fully and uh, um, less capable and less willing to be just more of a community outfit. So. Good point. Yeah, and one of the I, I, one of the really cool projects I noticed on your website, the peculiar form, was the business cards cut out of was like cereal boxes. Yeah, those are cereal boxes. That's one of the things that we really love to do with the technology and sort of the idea of the peculiar form is questioning sort of traditional concepts or traditional ideas of things. Um, one of the big things that we don't think has been pushed enough is that this technology is green. Um, not green because it's using biodiesel or it's this or that. It's because robots are making things right next to you as opposed to ships carrying stuff halfway around the world where they're being made by basically slave labor. Um, so um, we, we think that in the context of the same thing, that the, the cards cover um, reduce uh, or reuse, recycle. And in that, that sort of um, 
concept of uh, being um, sustainable in the United States, we think it's sort of a joke because people consume more. So you can recycle all you want, but if you could keep consuming more, then there's no um, really positive aspect yeah. of recycling. So our idea was it's called um, direct recycling or direct reuse. And the idea is if you could use these rapid prototyping machines to take something like your cereal boxes and you make your cards using the ink that's already on there and you're just etching the ink away, then what's left is this um, uh, sort of resulting piece that would be almost impossible to, from the ground up, develop and do the same thing. It would be just so costly to have cereal boxes printed with these designs, then etch them away and do all, I mean, if I went to a graphic designer and wanted that from scratch, that would be just a tremendous project. Yet, by just rethinking what it is to, instead of recycle, but to reuse, go to the first step of it, and we have the technology to easily readapt it. And it's um, at that point we started questioning: then what can the technology leverage? And um, like the ARL, the um, the precision. So we were like, if it can go 0.03 millimeters, that's the uh, maximum tolerance. We're like, how thick is that ink? And so we started playing with the thicknesses of the ink that's laid onto uh, a, a, a box for cereal. And we're really interested in. What can these tools that we get, what can they do? Like how light of a touch can they give? How deep can they do? How, can, how much can they cut? Can, can we cut a full inch of uh, uh, plywood by hitting it two times without burning an edge at a lower speed? We like to really push um, all the details and capabilities of our tools for sure. That, that's what I found really cool was it wasn't just about cutting. The, you know, the, the, the laser cutter is, is offering new design opportunities. Exactly, and it's imperative that we push that. Yes. So, so what else have you found so far? I mean, obviously, you know, like before I had seen your site, I'd never heard about etching away ink on cardboard. So, you know, what other things have you found that are you know, untraditional for a laser cutter? Well, you know, um, it's hard. One thing we've really tried to do is do more um, sort of 3D etching and trying to find out which materials burn away at what rate. And uh, like we've uh, done some testing on skateboard decks, on um, uh, different children's toys with like uh, different slotting and stuff like that. Um, and really trying to see uh, if we can, on a 2D laser, do basically three axis stuff. Even if it's um, shooting two and three sheets and then stacking them and making more what would be traditional sort of like slot manufactured components. Like um, if you look at old... Um, cassette decks that were made in the 80s and stuff. Everything's very thin sheet uh, metal, so all the mechanisms are basically flat. So we're trying to do uh, a lot of that with chipboard, where we look at what was traditional sort of mechanisms that were flat mechanisms and see if we can't recreate them with chipboard and like cheaper materials. So stuff that was made with, say, thin sheets, sheets of aluminum or pressed steel, can we uh, come up with the same sort of precision and detail with chipboard or, you know, stuff that's recycled cardboard, basically. And so um, there was the other project, I think, on our website. It's like geometries or something like that. And it, what we're trying to do is make complex shapes out of um, perforated cardboard and all the pins, what's pinning them together is also cardboard. And with eventually the hope to maybe um, brushing, like, a, uh, liquid ABS on it, hardening it, this type of thing. But the idea of using uh, flat paper as an ability to be rigid sheet material um, is probably a pretty big one that we're doing. That's pretty cool. So do you, you know, do you have any designs or ideas for production later, or is this you just want to see what the technology can do and you just want to push it as far as you can? That's really it right now, yeah. Um, we... Um, uh, Years ago, the idea was that we'd be an ideas lab. Um, we're really not uh, entrepreneurs. We don't. I, um, we really get soured when those types of things come in. Outside of you know budget, like what materials can I use? What can I afford? Once you get into like how many you can make and you can sell this and that and which market and this, it, we feel like that starts to really dilute the uh, the focus and the intent from a positive one to what we would consider a negative one. I mean, if that's where we went, we would have never got the laser cutter because there was nothing to afford the laser cutter for to make the widgets for. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think we sort of come backwards is that if you have the tools and you're a creative group and you use the tools to constantly do research, the ideas of things to make, the widgets will 
come out of those will happen yeah exactly and even the more you communicate with other people that you're working with and do collaborations the opportunities arise from uh, that interaction as well so um, uh, I've found a lot of um, ideas happened out of doing service work for other clients as well because I'm not going to necessarily be able to use every single material that exists and try to do every type of cutting there exists. So, um, for instance, the push start, they took a bunch of um, rubber, basically, and were cutting patterns out of the rubber. And I had been in Guatemala years later and realized that uh, they're making belts in Guatemala from rubber trees. And I was like, wow, you could laser cut patterns into you know, long strands of rubber and make, you know, really cool rubber belts that are completely green or this or that. But not that I'm doing that, but it was just a quick, um, you know, uh, um, landing in my head of an idea of just like how you can directly go to um, a product and be able to ma manufacture it. And that is where we want to go when it, the, the peculiar store um, is, uh, we are developing a store that would be focused on manufacturing these ideas as we have them. So the store would be sort of a virtual store online with virtual products that get manufactured as you order them. Um, and long term, we'd like to see, you know, if, if that um, takes traction, you know, maybe teaming up with other laser cutters and other places to where you could order it and then you get it maybe laser cut cheaper locally. Again, on the green thing that, you know, this stuff is made by robots, by robots made in the United States, so that as opposed to robots in some manufacturing facility on the other side of the world, no, it should be the robot that's down the street from you and the Kinkos that just prints off the cool Kozik thing or the this or that design, you know, that you know, we can still limit the run. We can say that there's 200 of these as they get ordered and printed, that's it, next one's version two. So you can have all the great things that you have with mass production, you can have lines, you can have iterations, but you don't have to spend all the money to manufacture them up front and pay the cost of like uh, um, shipping and all of these things. I know um, people that do custom toys that I work with and one of their biggest costs is the, the manufacturing delivery time. And they have the window from China to here and it takes up about 20 to 30% of their budget and it keys their marketing, it keys everything else. And it's sort of just ludicrous. Um, and so we're trying to, yeah, find a space for um, uh, products, um, items, and still doing the research and stuff. But so, we don't have one take over the other. So you really, you really want to make that supply chain, like, you know, really tiny. Exactly. Like, like minutes, if possible. That's the thing. Those should get as close as possible. We want to extra extricate all of the middlemen who look at just money get them out of the picture and we want the idea, the creator and the people using it as close to, you know, as possible to each other. And hopefully, you know, that's where we see a positive role for robots. Our sort of joke is um, uh, uh, stuff made, made by, let's see, robots made by robots in the United States. Uh, it's something like that. But the idea is that we just, you know, um, the robots is the, the idea of robots is the green thing, you know, that, uh, yeah proximity to them, like them becoming closer and closer to us, these manufacturing tools. And that's the way we think of the laser cutter. It's a robot. It's talking to my computers, they're robots. And the, that, uh, well, I think a good, the reason why is because it integrates it into your own sort of um, being, your own uh, abilities, as opposed to it's a printer. Um, it's something that's um, autonomous and disparate. And um, we don't think it is, and that's where you can start doing the cereal box thing. Is when you start, well, what if we're not going to print on the printer? What if we're printing on the laser cutter? And then we go back on the printer and use the pieces that we got, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, that type of thinking, I think, is lots of fun and leads us to come up with new ideas. You know? That's really cool. So, so what are some of the lessons you've learned offering this service? You know, what are some of the things that you know you didn't know before? You go through this process, you start doing it, and you're like, "Oh wow, that was you know." I mean, was it like a was there like a particular speed bump obstacle you guys had to overcome, or just something cool that you've learned? Um, well, uh, well, the biggest one is working with people, um, and that uh, we found that craft is a very ambiguous word. We love craft, we love digital craft, we're very supportive of craft, and then there's um, craft in a sense, the definition of sort of, not half-assed, but um, uh, not rigorous, maybe. And so 
we've ran into, and I don't know if it's just an Austin thing or what, but we we ran into some of that. We came at it probably a, a, a little too altruistic and a little naive in that sense. And we've realized that um, focusing towards people that have uh, uh, not necessarily a long term intent, but an intent, a focus. They're trying to get something done. They're they're be it entrepreneurial or not. Um, just that there's something bigger than just wanting to get one done cheaply. Um, and that's probably the biggest thing we realized is that it's not for everyone. Um, and that it's not some big democratic thing um, that sort of does get pushed out of the Fab Lab, MIT, Gershenfeld thing from the TED Talks from five years ago that sort of started a lot of this. I think a lot of that stuff misses um, things. Um, but... You know that that's. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, d yeah, it does. So basically, it's you know, it's, it's focusing on what's really important and finding that audience that you want to work with that values what you offer. Completely, yeah, completely. Um, and yeah, there was definitely uh, a big early chunk of people that it was a novelty, and so oh wow, there. I mean, there was a client that came really nice um, uh, that wanted to do custom purses, and she had. Um, seen a YouTube of in China them doing these purses on laser cutters. So she comes to me and says, look at this YouTube video. I want to do that. And I had to educate her that, well, that's their facilities. I have no idea what their laser cutter settings are. I have no idea what their like fabrication facilities are set up. I was like, that's a manufacturing facility specifically for whatever purse company or purse manufacturing organization. And I uh, was trying to educate her that you need to figure out then your own manufacturing process. I can't figure that out for you. If I do, I'm going to charge you a lot of money. Yeah, <laughs> so, it's expensive. Yeah, yeah. But those are the types of things we really didn't consider is like, oh, you know, we could laser cut stuff for people. No, what they need is an actual, like, <laughs> manufacturing, you know, process. So, like, that, there's a, a big... Um, step that I think a lot of people miss when you start coming into this technology because cost versus expectations runs into a big wall. Um, I can take someone uh, that wants to just do some test files and different materials and before they know it they've spent $400, $500 and they're wondering what for and it's like well you're doing R&D. Like, yeah. like, I, I, you know, I don't cut your le leather for free to find out how it will work. You know, so. Um, that that's been a a big uh, thing. Okay, it's a good point. Yeah, that's good to know. Yeah, well, it's I mean, the, as the technology becomes more accessible, um, then awareness of its um, sort of um, its use um, becomes more of an issue because it's so new, it's so novel that there's just a lot of ignorance. And so, just because it's accessible now, um, for instance, Lowe's in North Austin, I found out from some people in San Francisco, is going to be the very first Lowe's that has a three-axis three mill. And I'd always wondered why a Home Depot or Lowe's didn't have a mill, just one mill room. And um, But now my thinking is, they're opening out in Round Rock, they're going to get a lot of people that want, like, big wooden stars. You know, they're, like, that's... They're not going to get, you know, at a Lowe's, they're going to get a horse, people that want a horse that's going to be on their baby's, you know, carriage or people that want to, which is fine, but that's not what we were interested in at all. And so <laughs> we ran into some of that and it's something we were completely uh, aware of. But it's going to be interesting to see how Lowe's adopts that. Like, where is the education level that the people that come in with a three axis mill file, um, where do they go from there? So I think there's going to be a big sort of learning curve between this technology being in people's garages or make ATX in little community outfits, robot groups, to a Kinko's Lowe's type of thing. But I think we're right here where that's happening, and it's interesting to see people because we get a lot of them because, you know, um, I have a background of web design. That's the main way we have now. So we, we get really high up on the – if you're searching for laser cutting in Austin, you'll probably see us. So we get a lot of calls, a lot of people, and um, we found more and more a lot of times that um, they don't really know exactly how they want to use any particular technology. So they just they found a cool tool and they want to try something out. Yeah, they saw it on YouTube. It solved someone else's problems. A A B C. We're ready to go. Let's call this guy and the laser cut everything for us. <laughs> it's like, and they they really do sort of think of it like it's an inkjet printer. I've got my book, press print, and we'll get ready to go. Nice. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. It was great learning about the laser cutters.
Uh, my pleasure. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to you know give us a call and uh, um, go to uh, the peculiar form regularly, and we'll probably have more stuff up soon. So. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day. You Bye. Too.